Good morning, everybody. I don't know about you, but I love summer. Uh, We're all my summer people. No, you're all winter people, aren't you? Um, And summer people? Okay, more over this side, I think, than that side. But, you know, I love summer. Uh, I don't know whether, I don't know how much summer we've actually had. Um, I was hoping that today would have been a little bit warmer and that would have fit the theme of summer psalms today. So I'm just a little bit disappointed, but it is a little bit warm. So we'll open up the windows, put the air con on, but I love, I love summer. This is my summer get up. You know, this is my summer get up. If I'm on, if I'm on holidays, this is, this is, this is me. I, I normally wear shorts though. But I don't want to be a distraction for anybody. Um, <laughs> so, so I decided to, 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 to cover, cover up. And the things I love about summer, I love barbecues. I love, the, of course, I love the warmer weather, but I love barbecues. I love having the cricket on the TV. Okay, yeah, thank you, Peter. Um, everyone else is going, mm, yeah. <laughs> I love the barbecues. <laughs> uh, we can change the channel of the cricket. Um, I, love, um, I love super dupers. I love Super Dupers. For me, you know, that's summer. Um, when I was growing up, we didn't really have Super Dupers. We had Sunny Boys. Yeah, Sunny Boys. But um, the same, same deal. You put them in the freezer, and on a really hot day, you know, you drip it all down your front. It's amazing. Um, so I love summer. And on top of that, um, I love wearing my thongs. Um, I didn't wear thongs today. I just wore Burks. But, um, but I love summer. I love daylight savings. Because daylight savings means you can do all of that for much longer. So I love daylight savings, and so I thought I'd dress uh, appropriately for the theme, um, and I I never really thought about how you would actually join Psalms and Summer together, Um, but hey, why why not? Um, Here's the thing, just like in the Psalms, Summer isn't always sunshine and super dupers. You know, if you have children, putting little children to bed during daylight savings, it's a mess, right? It's a nightmare. Plus, um, there's flies, sunburn, um, you know, there's uh, hay fever. Uh, And if you're anything like me, um, I've got this really uh, kind of unnatural, it's probably a spiritual gift somewhere in the Bible, where I smell things really intensely. So I can go, "Ah, yeah, I can smell smoke. Oh, yeah, I can smell dirty nappy. Oh, you know, and so summertime, it just seems to bring those smells out. So for somebody like me, it's really, summertime can be really, really yucky. And also, um, sweat. <laughs> My sweat, your sweat, you know. Um, I said uh, just before Christmas that I love giving people hugs on the way out. Summertime isn't a great time for hugs. So I'm happy for a fist bump, um, you know, because it's just, yeah, yeah. Anyway, so summertime. Um, but here's the thing about summer is that pretty much like any other season in life, it has its good times and bad times, Right? And I think that's our connection to the Psalms, is that when you read the Psalms, you know, there there are praise Psalms, there are Psalms that rejoice and call us to rejoicing, but then there's Psalms that call out cursing, and Psalms that are really sad and and lament. Um, And I think that's really interesting, because that really captures our human experience, doesn't it? So that's what the Psalms um, seems to do for me. There's times of great joy, great praising, but there's also a time for sadness, and that's our human experience, because we live in a broken world, we're broken people. And I've heard it said that we can either get um, sad, mad, or bad. And I think there's no greater season than summer than that actually happens. Sad, mad, and bad. You know, something hurts us, we get sad. Something hurts us really badly, we get mad. And then we have a choice then whether we actually let it go to the next level, whether we actually let it go bad. And here's what I love about the Psalms, is that the Psalms actually give a, a creative expression to those times so that we can actually give vo- it gives voice to that, that pain, gives voice to the the frustrations, it gives voice and, and words to just our humanity, and it can stop us, it can rescue us from actually going bad. And so the Psalms can kind of rescue us from that, um, and the Psalms just isn't a place where God gives us permission to be expressive with him with our experiences, it's the place where he beckons us to come to him in all the realness and rawness that reality and life can, can happen and brings to us. And, and uh, why? Because he can handle it. If I was to come to you and just go, here's, here's my life, here's what's going on in my life, and here's what's going bad, and here's what's going good, you may not be able to handle it. In fact, it might fracture our relationship. You might go, not with God. 
God actually goes, tell me a little bit more. Let's get real about that. Let's, let's, see, see where, let's explore that. And that's what I love about the Psalms. So, um, so while summer is a time where, you know, we really should um, put on our protective clothing, make sure that, that we, um, not those glasses, these glasses, where, you know, slip, slop, slap, and there's a few other words now that have been joined on to it. Um, but, you know, we actually protect ourselves from the, the harmful effects of the sun. The Psalms actually beckon us to get completely bare before the S-O-N sun, so that we are more exposed to his radiance and his light, his beauty and his goodness. And we're not hiding anymore. We're not, we're not pretending anymore. So I've titled today's message, Honest to God, because I feel like that's a phrase that we sometimes use, you know, when we're, when we're really trying to get real with somebody. And we'll just say this phrase, look, honest to God, this is what's happening. It's like I, I'm putting my hand on my heart. This is fair income. This is real. This is authentic. This is true. Honest to God. And that's why I've titled this message today in our first message of our Summer Psalm series, Honest to God, because I think this is what the Psalms actually allow for us to do. Get real honest with God. Today, uh, we kick off this new series. And what I want to do today is just give you a little bit of, bit of teaching, a little bit of background. And some of this stuff you may already know, and that's great. But I know that sometimes there's people in the room that, um, that are fairly new to church, new to the Bible, and so I want to just touch a little bit about that to begin with. And then I want to talk about a psalm. But ongoing, week after week, throughout the summer, we're going to be looking at a particular psalm. We've got different speakers that are going to be speaking on a particular psalm and drawing out some of these aspects to you. So today, here's where I want to start. I want to start with the Bible. If you're new to church, if you're new to the Bible, the Psalms is a book of the Bible. The Bible really is just... The Bible, the word Bible is a collect, just means collection of books. That's what the Bible is, a collection of books. And there are, num, there are a number of books. And so the Psalms is found in the first section of the Bible, which, we, we, which is the Old Testament, which is everything God wanted us to know before Jesus. The second part of the Bible is the New Testament, and that's everything God wanted us to know about Jesus and life as a church as we follow him. So the book of Psalms is found in the where? Old Testament. That's right. And um, unlike other books in the Bible who have a single author, the Psalms have multiple authors. Now, we believe that God is the author of the Bible. Amen? But he uses, through the power of his spirit, uh, uh, people like you and me, well, probably not like you and me. I know I wouldn't want to be responsible for writing some of the Bible, and maybe you wouldn't either. But God has inspired people over thousands of years to be able to write down the things that God wants to say to people. And today we have a collection of that uh, available to us. And the book of Psalms is, has a variety of writers because they themselves are a collection. And uh, perhaps you were told, um, uh, maybe in Sunday school or whatever, that David was the writer of Psalms. And that's true to some point, but he's not the only author of Psalms. He's not the only writer. David King David writes about half of the Psalms, but there are other writers as well. Solomon, David's son, Moses, Asaph, who was a worship leader um, uh, under King David. There were the sons of uh, Korah, who were attributed to um, praise and worship. And there are a few others um, that we really don't know who wrote them. Many different writers, but David was the main writer and contributor of the Psalms. So the Psalms are found in the Old Testament. The Psalms have a uh, uh, many different writers. Um, including uh, David, and that's, that's a psalm we're going to look at today. Um, but what is, what is a psalm? Because that's just a weird word. Like, and if, you're not, if you haven't been around church, or if you don't know the Bible, uh, you know, a, a psalm just sounds a bit weird. So a psalm really it, it comes from a, a Greek word that means stringed instrument. But a psalm really was attributed really to a, a poem or a piece of writing, a creative piece of writing, much like a poem that addresses an experience that the particular writer has been going through. And uh, these have been, for thousands of years, been put to music. And so that's why when the Bible was translated um, into, into Greek, um, the word uh, psalm was given to it because these writings were, were often played to music. And so um, psalm actually means like a string instrument. So that's, that's the association there. Um, and over time, psalms became um, a part of corporate worship in the, in, in the church. Often, someone would recite one of these psalms as a poem or as a piece of creative writing, and in the background, there would be musicians playing along. 
Oftentimes, people would become so familiar with the psalm that they would join in and sing it to the music. And isn't that amazing? That's kind of like what we do today, that we have pieces of creative writing. Uh, And it's so interesting to me because even today, in our modern corporate worship, we tend to stay away from songs that focus on me. You know those songs that focus on, oh, I'm feeling this and I'm doing this. and I, But that's what the Psalms were. I find that really interesting that today there's, a, there's like, oh, we've got to keep away from that. All of praise has to, be, has to be always about God, always about God. But here in the Psalms, it's so interesting because it takes our experiences, places them before a great God and a good God, and allows God to speak over them and do whatever God needs to do. So it's just, I, I just find that interesting. So there's a little bit of a background um, about the Psalms, and I want to just give you just quickly three of my observations of their purpose or their function or what they really, or how they can be described, if you like. And the first one is, is that they kind of give expression to our humanity, what we go through in life. Now, anyone journal? A few, few people journal. And so, so what you do when you journal, you actually give expression through words, uh, about the experiences that you're going through in life. And the Psalms, they do that. And if you notice anything when reading the Psalms, you'll certainly notice that they are raw and they're brutally honest. It would be like taking your journal and bringing it up to me and allowing me to read it before this congregation. And not only that, we'll get Rob, we'll get Sarah, we'll get, get, get the band up here playing some music to it, and we'll sing those words that you wrote out. Anyone want to do that? We can organize that for next week. Happy to do that. (laughs) So that's kind of an expression of our humanity. And most of the Bible, the rest of the Bible, was really God's words written to us. And the difference with the Psalms is that these are our words written to God. And so there's a bit of a distinction there as well. And they don't paint a picture of perfection. So if I was writing and I brought my journal in, I would make sure that I edited it before anyone else got to to read it out, right? And I'm sure you would too. But they don't. And if you go through the Psalms and you read the Psalms, you will read that they are brutally honest about their experiences. They're not hiding. It's this honest to God, rawness, realness about what they're going through in life. And I, I think that's, that's so incredible because really it's not a picture of perfection. It's really a, a, a reflection of our brokenness that is what we, what we read in the Psalms. And the writers allow a kind of a permission. They kind of give it, give it to us in a way that says, I can do this. I can write and I can get real before God. And it kind of gives us permission to do the same, to get real before God. They give us an expression to our humanity. And the second way is that they display a creativity in the way that they've been written. So when we read the Psalms, um, they really speak to the creativity that God has given to us because some of them um, um, really are a a portrait of artistic expression. Um, Some of the Psalms are written as poems and they've been carefully constructed as such. And so we've been able to study the Psalms and the construction of the Psalms And, you know, you probably don't give too much thought. When you're writing in your journal, you probably just go, this happened, this happened, this happened, that person said that, and I felt like that, I should have given it, you know. And the Psalms do that, but the Psalms go, you know what, I'm going to be a little bit concise, succinct, and I'm going to bring out the the highlights, but yet I'm still going to be raw and honest in what I'm writing writing about. And they're written in such a way that's raw and real, but yet they reflect creativity. And we see that in the church today. The songs that we sing, we see that they're written in such a creative way. They're real, they're raw, but often the songs that we sing in corporate worship, one person probably wrote or two people in a room wrote about their experiences, what they're going through. So even the songs that we sing today are not that dissimilar to the Psalms. That's why some of the songs that we sing, you might be able to relate to because you're going through that same experience. Some of the songs that we sing corporately in worship, you might go, oh, I don't like this song, because you can't relate to it. And you'll find that that's the same when you read the Psalms as well. There'll be some Psalms that you're drawn to because the same experience that that writer is having in the Psalms, you go, that's me. 
That's putting words to my experience. And that's the creative effect that God's using to draw us in and to be able to read it. So it's true that some of the writing in the Psalms, they've originally started out perhaps as someone's journal or a poem or a prayer. But God's people knew way back then what we know now, that there is power in a song. There is power in singing songs together. There's something amazing about when you can sing a song and and everybody sings it together. I surrender all. Right? We're singing this song together. And, And it's just uplifting. It's encouraging, right? And it's the same thing that's happening here. God knew way back in the Psalms when these were being written how they would be used. And they're even used today. So the Psalms give us the words to say to be expressively honest with God. They display creativity. But here's another way that the Psalms can function, that they provide wisdom and instruction for the many different circumstances that we go through in life. The Psalms give us a glimpse, you see, of the character of God, what God's like, and who he is. And it also gives us a blueprint of how we are to live in relationship with God. And this is interesting. It actually gives us a blueprint on how we are to relate to God and how God is actually allowing us to relate to him. So it's in the Bible, I believe, as an instruction to us as God's people that we can come to God and we can be brutally honest with whatever's going on in our life because God's big enough and good enough to be able to handle whatever you're bringing to him. And that's what I see in the Psalms. They provide wisdom, instructions for living, a blueprint for living a righteous life. But it also gives us instructions on what to do when things don't go well. In the Psalms, we read about confession and repentance. These are words to to bring to God to go, you know what? I don't have it all together. Things aren't going well. I'm struggling. I can't cope. This is too much for me. And it uses language to say, you know what? It's okay. God is big enough to carry you through that season. And that's what the Psalms bring to us. It's incredible, right? I love it. It's an honest to God approach to life. But here is the one thing that I want you to understand and take away today. Is that it required the writer of the Psalm to be completely, unashamedly, brutally, refreshingly honest to God and what the Psalms teach us is that we can be real in a similar way showing us that we're not only allowed to come to God as as we are but it's fundamentally absolutely required to do so God does not want you to go to him half-hearted wearing a mask with half truth just haphazardly he wants us to go to him he beckons us to come to him in the fullness of reality of who we are, what we're going through, he's, because he's big enough and good enough to handle anything. This is how C.S. Lewis puts it. He says, there in the Psalms, I find an experience fully God-centered, asking of God no, uh, God no gift more urgently than his presence, the gift of himself, joyous to the highest degree and unmistakably real. God wants us to be real. And we see this in the Psalms, but we see, see it ever so clearly in one particular Psalm that I've chosen to close with today. Anyone know which Psalm it is, by the way? Oh, okay. Show offs. Okay. And so if you have your Bible or you have the Bible app, I'm going to invite you to open it to Psalm 51. And if you don't have it, that's okay. We've got, we've got them up on, up on the screen as well. Here is King David. Israel's greatest king is writing this psalm. And what I want you to do is pay attention to his words and the anguish behind the words that he writes. Pay attention. And if you can, just pay attention to the feelings, the anguish behind these words. He says, Have mercy on me, O God, because of your unfailing love. Because of your great compassion, blot out the stains of my sins. Wash me clean from my guilt. Purify me from my sin, for I recognize my rebellion, and it haunts me day and night. Uh, 
pretty heavy words. They're pretty heavy words. And here's what's happening. David, as David writes these words, chances are pages blur because he's probably writing them through tears. And maybe when you've journaled and when you've written things down, maybe your pages have become blurred as well as you write down the feelings and, and through feelings of great anguish or turmoil or frustration or sadness, you're writing and expressing the, this. And David's doing the same. And, um, and we begin to understand what David felt as he writes these words. But here's what's going on for David. David is at his lowest moment. David's at his lowest moment. You can read about this in 2 Samuel chapter 12. I won't go into detail because we have children in the room, but it's to do with Bathsheba and her husband. And David has strayed from God. He sins. And then he tries to cover it all up. And it just makes things worse. It is a complete and utter mess. You know what a mess is like. I know what a mess is like. You, just like me, have sinned, and we've probably tried to cover it up. We've tr probably tried to overlook it, dismiss it, justify it perhaps. Uh, we know what, that, what that's like. We've all had those experiences, right? And if you haven't, it's coming. Happy New Year, everybody. <laughs> um, if you've had one of those moments, the lowest moments, you will remember how it feels. And if you can, you can probably tap into some of what David's writing about here um, from the perspective of 2 Samuel chapter 12. It's a mess. And I've been in plenty of messes. Uh, I'll give you a, a G-rated one today. Uh, and hopefully it'll somewhat illustrate my point. Um, when Sarah and I built our first home, uh, it was very exciting. We got to go and pick, pick the colours on the walls. Uh, we got to go and pick out some furniture. And we decided that uh, we would pick out the colour of the carpet. And for some strange reason, we decided to go with a very cream white carpet. Now... This is before kids. And so we had all of our older friends go, you guys, you know, you probably want to go a little bit of a darker kind of coloured carpet. Um, and we've gone, no, we want white carpet. And we got white carpet. And it looked fantastic, everybody. <laughs> it looked amazing. And then we had kids. <laughs> and then we had kids. Um, um, but we didn't have kids at the time. And everyone was saying, oh, you know, kids, they'll spill stuff on it. You know, you, it'll, it'll, it'll end up looking nice when you get it in. But, you know, after a little while, with all the kids spilling stuff on it, it's just going to be a nightmare. And, you know, it's just going to be horrendous. It's not going to end well. Well, um, we got the white carpet. And then we had our first child, Laura. And uh, I remember one night, Sarah had gone away for work and it was just myself at home with, with Laura. Uh, Laura had uh, probably only just started walking at the time. And, um, and so she was incredibly young. Um, and one night when Sarah was away for work, I decided that I would eat a bowl of spaghetti bolognese on the couch. <laughs> Come on, we've all done it. Okay, <laughs> don't you judge me. And the arms of our couch, you know, uh, it wasn't flat, it was curved. We still got the couches. And so I was balancing the, um, the bowl of spaghetti bolognese on the armchair of the couch. The bowl of spaghetti was knocked uh, from the armrest of the couch and fell all over the white carpet, bolognese sauce everywhere. But here's the thing. Laura had absolutely nothing to do with it. <laughs> Uh, in the words of the great theologian, Taylor Swift, it's me, hi, I'm the problem, it's me. And I put my hand up to it. I knocked it over and I did everything I could to get the redness out of that white carpet, get the bolognese sauce stain out of the carpet, but I couldn't. And so then I, I did what every person would do, and I'm sure, don't you, don't you say that you don't do this, because I know you do. You then begin to, to craft a defence of how it happened and why it happened and how it utterly could not be avoided and prevented. Um, and so I started to go through my mind about um, how I could justify that all of a sudden this bowl of spaghetti bolognese just launched off the, off the couch and onto the carpet. And, uh, and so that's what I did. I just started to think and craft my defence for when Sarah got home. And I thought, easy, blame Laura. <laughs> Baby Laura. Baby Laura, and I, there was a million ways in which I could actually craft a defense and blame baby Laura, 
Oh, she was in my arms, she wouldn't settle, and I was having dinner, and oh, she just kicked the bowl on the floor. So many ways I thought of to come to my defense. But with every, every defense, every argument that I brought up, I just felt too guilty. I can't blame the little baby Laura. Uh, what a terrible dad I, I would be. And so I thought, okay, I'll, I can't shift the blame, so I'll do the next best thing, which is hide it. Cover it up. And so um, we, had a little, um, we had a little carpet mat, so I just sort of went, put a coffee table on top of it, done. Sarah will never know, ever. And I thought, and this is a good plan, I thought it was a good plan anyway. I thought, just leave it there just long enough until the rest of the carpet gets stained and dirty, and this one will blend right in. <laughs> and you won't even know the difference. Okay, so... That's my argument. That's what I did. Um, back to the story in Psalm 51. I'll come back to this little story in a moment. But here is David, and he's trying to manage his sin. He's trying to cover it up. He's trying to, he's trying to just avoid taking any responsibility for it at all. And here he is, and like many of us, it's like, I see a stain. There's a stain on my carpet. But I'm going to do what I can to cover it up and go, well, what stain? I don't see any stain. Do you see any stain? And that's what we do in life. If life is a white carpet, we've got plenty of, <laughs> plenty of stains on it, right? And that's what's happening in Psalm 51 as David starts to write, but not yet. Because what God does is God wants to bring this to, to David's attention. And look, through life, we get stained and we scrub and scrub. We do whatever we humanly possibly can to, to rub that stain out. We do whatever we can to make that happen, but it doesn't work. We try doing all the right things, and it doesn't get rid of the stain. We try to be moral, but it didn't work. You know, we try being religious, but it didn't work. The stain's still there. We try to be good people and get involved in church life, but guess what? The stain is still there. And it just doesn't work because the more that we try to rub it out, the more we seem to make a mess of it. And the stain is still there for many of us here in this room today. And what do we do? We just try to cover it up. We just try to just maneuver through life. And, 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 and we think, well, if I just kind of cover, cover it all up and just sort of go through life, you know, avoiding talking about it or opening myself up, and if I just stay, go through life hiding, then I won't ever be confronted by the stain but here's what God does, and this is why God's amazing, is that any time that there is sin, whenever there's a stain, there's always going to be a disconnect in relationship. And it might be a relationship between you and the person who sinned against you. It may be a relationship that's broken, that's disconnected because you sinned against somebody else. But ultimately, it's a broken relationship between you and God because that's what sin does. It breaks your relationship off with him. A pure and holy God cannot stand to be in the presence of sin but he loves you and he wants to be connected with you so God has to find this way in order to bridge that gap between his holiness and your putrid ugly sin because he loves you so he's got to come up with a way to do that and um, if you've been around the church for any length of time especially over Easter you know that God sent his one and only son whoever believes in him would have their sins forgiven, pardoned, and be set free from that and come into a reconnected relationship with God. You see, God doesn't settle for broken relationships. God doesn't settle for broken relationships. So God lovingly confronts David with the prophet Nathan. We all need a Nathan in our life. I've literally got a friend Nathan in my life, uh, and I've given him full permission to confront me. And there's been times where I've literally gone to my Nathan and gone, here it is. And he'll help me, he'll pray for me, he'll support me. We all need Nathans in our life. God sent a Nathan to David to convict David of his sin. And David is broken, which brings me to this very important point, is that God is going to bring him back. See, God's discipline is not to get back at us, it's to bring us back. God's discipline is never just to get back at us. It's to bring us back. Because broken relationships aren't good enough for God, especially when it comes to us and him. 
And so the way we come back to God is just by getting real. Getting real with God. It means I'm going to stop trying to manage the state of my sin. I'm going to stop trying to cover it up. I'm stop, going to stop trying to scrub it out. And I'm, and I'm just going to expose it to God. I'm going to get real, honest to God, real with God. Own it, fess it up, you know, take responsibility. And that's what David does. Now look at this verse in verse 4 of Psalm 51. Let's go back here. Got the backstory now. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are proved right when you speak and justified when you judge. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me, but restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. And then a little later on, he says, A broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. David just comes to God and he just lays it all out. He t- and it takes tremendous courage to, to do that. And, it, and if, if I just could stop and ask, when was the last time you did that? When was the last time you just had an honest to God conversation where you just painted the, re- the realest picture before God of what's going on with you? The, this is what happens, and I, I, maybe you need to do it today, but David accepts the conviction from Nathan through God, like through, by God through Nathan, of his wrongdoing. He isn't in denial, he's not defensive. While he did try to cover it up, he's now taking full responsibility. And he's coming to God, honest to God, raw, real, refreshingly honest, and he's just getting real with God. And if this isn't the best description of repentance, I don't know whether I could find you another one. And it's not a get out of jail free card either. There are still consequences that David has to go through. Um, There are still consequences that occur from David's actions. But God forgives him. He He removes the stain, everybody. Only God can do that. He removes the stain and, and the relationship between God and David is restored. And in his book, Open and Unafraid, David Taylor comes to this conclusion when it comes to the Psalms. He writes, what the Psalms offer us is a powerful aid to unhide, to stand honestly before God without fear, to face one another vulnerably without shame and to encounter life in the world without any of the secrets that would demean and distort our humanity. In other words, we're all stained. We can't get the stain out ourselves. And the great news is that God doesn't hide from us or wait for us to become clean before he allows us to come to him. He says, come to me just as you are right now in the most raw realness of whatever you're going through, come to me in exactly this. I have this, so I have this stain on my carpet, okay? And uh, I've tried to get it out. I've scrubbed and scrubbed. I've used everything under the kitchen sink. You know, that's where you keep all the cleaning products, right? Under the kitchen sink. I've I've squirted every bottle possible (laughs) onto this stain. And I scrubbed on my hands and knees, trying to scrub it. and, And it's lathering up and, but, and, and if you've ever noticed that the, the lather is white like the carpet and you feel like you're making headway, you feel like this is working, everybody. I can do this. Sarah will never, ever know. And then, you know, you, you blot it. And in fact, you know, the, the word where, when David says, you blot out my sins, that's a laundry term. That's an ancient laundry term. You blot out my sins because that's what you do with a stain. You blot it out, right? And so I'm trying to blot out this stain in the carpet and it's still red. <laughs> It's still red. So I can't do anything. I try and cover it up. And uh, Sarah comes home. And Sarah has this knack of knowing precisely where everything is in the room. Oh, hang on. That photo frame's out of place. Uh, or, and she immediately sees, uh, sees this coffee table. She goes, oh, that's a bit of an odd place to put a coffee table. And I've gone, I know, right? Anyway, she discovers that there's a stain there. And... Um, and, you know, she's, she's pretty good, but she, 
she immediately knows that there's something's not right. She discovers a stain and she says, we just get in a commercial cleaner, someone qualified to get out the stain. And that's what we did. We got the whole, whole carpet steam cleaned, whatever. The stain's gone. Because someone who knows how to get the stain out came and got the stain out. And you know where this is going, right? Uh, let me finish by saying this. Can I encourage every one of us at the start of 2024 to just get honest to God? You know, this, this, at the start of this year, it's not a time to set goals or make New Year's resolutions. I want to I encourage us that this is a time of the year where we just get honest to God. We just get real. For some of you, it might mean just going to God as you are. If you're struggling with your sin, you just go to God and tell Him you're struggling. If you're fed up and just over it, whatever over it, whatever it is, just go to God and tell Him you're over it. If you're afraid of the year ahead, go to God and just tell Him, be real, I'm afraid of this year ahead. Go to God in full realness, rawness, transparency, because God already knows. He knows what's in your heart. And all he's asking us to do is in the same way that we read in the Psalms, just come and be real with me. Just get real. That's what the Psalms teach me. That they're honest to God. There's a realness to them. And, and I think summer Psalms is, is just about getting real with God. It's, it's taken off the sunnies and taken off the hat. It's taken off the mask. It's taken off the pretense. It's, it's getting bare. Because you can do that with the S-O-N sun. You can't do it with the S-U-N sun, but you can do it with the S-O-N sun. And that's the only way that he will accept us, by the way. Vulnerable and authentic. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I want to pray right now that for every person in this room, that we would just take a moment and in in whatever way we need, we would get real with you. That in this moment today, we wouldn't be distracted or let the opportunity pass by, but we would perhaps just in one or two sentences tell you something real right now, something that we've hidden, something that we've avoided, something that we've just tried to clean up our souls. We get real with you, God, and we invite you into it, whatever that situation is, just like Nathan to Daniel I pray that you might use me today as a catalyst for your spirit to knock on people's hearts. So whatever the spirit brings up for you, don't push it down, don't push it away, don't dismiss it, don't justify it, don't excuse it. Get real. Honest to God real. Take it to God now. Just give it to him. One or two sentences in your heart, bring it before a good God who loves you. There is no condemnation in Christ Jesus. We are all stained. But it's now whether or not we're going to choose to get real with it. So Father, I pray in the name of Jesus over every person here that at the start of 2024, you would take us as we are and we would come to you just as we are. Because we know that you love us and you accept us. You are with us and you are for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.